Hello, this is the video lecture for the digestive system, which is chapter 15 in your textbook. This is part two. We'll be picking up on page 75 in your notes outline. If you want to find it, we're going to start by labeling the diagram. Ducts connect from two organs to carry digestive juices, which are um, chemicals that aid in digestion to the small intestine, in particular, the duodenum of the small intestine. And those two organs are the gallbladder and the pancreas. So let's label the diagram that you have on page 75. And we will start with the liver and we'll go counterclockwise. So the liver is this very large organ that sits on top of the stomach. Next up, we have the gallbladder tucked in underneath the liver. Then there's the common bile duct, which is uh, one of the ducts that connects both the pancreas and the gallbladder to the small intestine. Fourth thing to label would be that part of the small intestine that the line is pointing to, and that would be the duodenum. Then we have the stomach. The pancreatic duct, which leads to the pancreas, that's where the pancreatic enzymes are secreted from. And finally, we have the pancreas. One last look at the three parts of the small intestine here. The duodenum receives the chyme or the mixture of um, food and chemicals coming from the stomach. Most chemical digestion, digestion takes place here in the duodenum. The jejunum is the second part of the small intestine. This is where most of the absorption is taking place of the nutrients into the bloodstream and into the lymph capillaries. Finally, we have the ileum and absorption continues. The last little bit of absorption will happen in the ileum right before um, everything is that's left will be dumped into the large intestine. Bariatric surgery, also known as gastric bypass, you probably have heard of it. It's surgical removal of part of the small intestine and stomach. That's one form of it. Um, another form of bariatric surgery is just to place a lap band around part of the stomach um, to create a smaller stomach pouch. This is recommended for morbidly obese patients. And the reason it would be recommended is that the risk from dying from being morbidly obese is greater than the risk from this surgery. This is known as a fairly low risk surgery. The final stop on our tour through the digestive system is the large intestine, also known as the colon. It includes the ascending, the transverse, and the de descending colon. The large intestine is about five feet long, 1.5 meters, and about three inches in diameter. It functions in absorption of water and salts. It also stores and eliminates feces. The large intestine is full of normal flora or bacteria. This is a symbiotic relationship between us and the microbes that live inside of us. There's trillions of microbes in our GI tract. When you're born, you have, right before you're born, you have no bacteria at all. So as a baby in the womb, you're bacteria free. But as soon as you're born and you um, get into the environment, bacteria are everywhere and you start collecting them. So these are symbiotic and that means that we help them, they help, help us. We give them a place to live and we give them food to eat. They help us by breaking down and manufacturing vitamins like vitamin K and the B vitamins. They also help prevent colonization of pathogenic bacteria. So they keep out the bad bacteria and they're really the good bacteria. They help us. Our intestinal bacteria population can be altered by antibiotics or disease. But if, they, if this gets altered, it's gonna repopulate over time just because there are so many bacteria in the environment. We can also speed up the repopulation of our normal flora by taking probiotics. Uh, most of the probiotics are strains of bacteria. Lactobacillus is one of them. The idea is that after you've swallowed them, they're gonna make their way through the stomach and take up residence in your intestines. 
The appendix is attached onto the large intestine. It's a small pouch that is attached to the large intestine and its function is to store normal or uh, non-pathogenic bacteria. Um, you might have heard of appendix as a vestigial organ, meaning it doesn't have a function in humans and it can be taken out with any adverse, without any adverse effects. Um, but scientists are on the fence as to whether it's truly vestigial or not. They think it does play a role in our immune system. Appendicitis is inflammation of the appendix. This results from a blockage that traps the infectious bacteria in the lumen of the appendix. When you have appendicitis, the pain is in your lower right abdomen. It's very uh, sharp pain. And you need to get to the doctor or the hospital because if your appendix ruptures, feces containing bacteria spray all over the abdominal contents. This can cause a um, infection called peritonitis, which is not a good infection to have. If you go see the doctor and your appendix is inflamed, you'll have surgery to have it removed. So as I said, water, salts, and vitamins are absorbed from the large intestine. That's the function of the large intestine. This adjusts the consistency of the feces or the waste material. So that's continually being adjusted. So disorders can occur in the adjustment of water and salts. And um, that two of those disorders are constipation or diarrhea. Constipation is too much water absorbed from the undigested material or fiber. That is basically what's left um, in your colon. Chronic constipation can lead to hemorrhoids and another condition called fecal impaction. Treatment of constipation is laxatives or, and or stool softeners. Diarrhea is the other end of the spectrum. Diarrhea is when not enough water is absorbed by the large intestine. This can be caused by um, um, like a food poisoning or viral condition. A stomach flu is another name for that. It can also be caused by Crohn's disease or irritable bowel syndrome. Complications of diarrhea, chronic diarrhea would be dehydration. Next disorder of the large intestine is lactose intolerance. In your notes, there's a typo. It says caused when the lactase gene is turned off. So it should be the lactase gene, the, le the gene that creates the enzyme lactase. Lactase is an enzyme that breaks down lactose into two monosaccharides, glucose and galactose. So if you don't have that gene, if you don't produce it, um, Lactose is a milk sugar, so anytime you eat anything dairy, yogurt, milk, cheese, anything like that, you're going to have um, problems with your digestive tract, gas, pain, bloating, things like that, nausea. Treatment of lactose intolerance is to change your diet to limit dairy. Also, you can buy over-the-counter lactase enzymes, so you can replace that enzyme and eat it with meals, which will help then your body to digest the lactose. Crohn's disease is inflammatory bowel disease. It causes inflammation of your digestive tract, which can lead to abdominal pain, severe diarrhea, fatigue, weight loss, and malnutrition. This is caused by an autoimmune condition. IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. This is cramping, abdominal pain, bloating, gas, diarrhea, or constipation. Um, they don't know the cause of irritable bowel syndrome. It's probably many things that can cause this to happen. Diverticulitis is infection or inflammation of the pouches that can form in your intestines. It's triggered by age. So the older you get, the higher chance you're going to have diverticulitis. It's triggered by obesity and a high fat diet. Polyps in your colon. This is a small clump of cells that form on the lining of the colon. Most colon polyps are benign. So it's a tumor, but it's a benign tumor, a grouping of cells. But over time, some colon polyps can develop into colon cancer. Both of these conditions, diverticulitis and polyps, can be diagnosed by a colonoscopy. Hemorrhoids are swollen veins in the lowest part of your rectum and anus, and they can become irritated and bleed. All right, those were fun. Now, 
a GI bleed. Let's say you're bleeding from your GI tract. Doctors need to know which part of your GI tract is bleeding. It's pretty long, right? From your mouth all the way down to the end of your um, large intestine. So they need to determine which part has been affected. If it's an upper GI bleed, this would be uh, when irritation and ulcers in the lining of the esophagus, stomach, or duodenum, that's your upper GI tract. If um, there's a bleed there, then you're going to have stools that's that are going to be black and sticky. So the blood will be very, very dark. If it's a lower GI bleed, that would be anywhere from the large intestine and rectum bleeding, including hemorrhoids. The stools will have a bright red color. They'll have bright red blood in them. So there, that's a way to determine whether it's an upper GI bleed or a lower GI bleed. A lab test to diagnose rectal or intestinal bleeding is called a fecal occult blood test. This looks for the presence of microscopic blood in the feces. All right, for the last part of this lecture, we're going to talk about the accessory organs of the digestive tract, and we're going to start with the liver. Remember that most digestion and absorption of nutrients occur in the small intestine. Just FYI, remember, remember that. The liver is the largest internal organ, and it has the most functions, I think, of any organ, over 500 functions. It sits under your rib cage on the right side of your body, and it supports every other organ in your body in some way. This organ is so important that you could only survive one or two days if it shuts down. So when we're talking about digestion and absorption of nutrients, step one is that the products of digestion are absorbed into the capillaries in the villi of the small intestine. Then these digested food molecules travel through the hepatic portal veins into the liver. So all of the food that's absorbed ends up going into the liver. The liver can monitor blood contents of many of the nutrients. And then it can deliver blood to the circulatory system and get the nutrients out there where they're needed. So some of the liver functions that you need to know about. Um, the liver is a detoxifier. It filters toxins out of the blood like drugs, chemicals, and alcohol. The liver also breaks down red blood cells as they get worn out and need to be replaced. The liver is the one that recycles them. The liver also forms and breaks down glycogen. So it, it stores glycogen. Remember, glycogen is a storage form of glucose. So it's able to either make more glycogen or um, break down the glycogen to release glucose into the bloodstream as needed. Insulin is also involved in producing the blood clotting factors. That would be like um, factor eight is made in the liver. And finally, the liver excretes bile to help with fat digestion and the bile is stored then in the gallbladder. A disorder of the liver is hepatitis. Um, hepatitis means inflammation of the liver. It can be chronic and it can destroy the liver over time if it's not taken care of. The effect of hepatitis is that the liver stops filtering bilirubin from the blood. Remember that bilirubin comes from the breakdown of red blood cells. So as the uh, liver is breaking down those red cells, it has to um, take that bilirubin and the bilirubin eventually gets broken down itself. So the liver is not able to do that anymore once the virus hepatitis um, attacks it. So bilirubin builds up. This gives people a yellowish tint to their skin and a yellowish tint to the whites of their eyes. It's called jaundice. Hepatitis is caused um, by five types of viruses, A through E, and we're going to talk about three of those, A, B, and C. So hepatitis A is the most common hepatitis virus. It is an oral fecal virus. That's where it's found. That means it can be acquired from sewage or it can be acquired from contaminated drinking water. There is a vaccine available for hepatitis A. Hepatitis B is a blood-borne pathogen. It's located in the blood. It's spread by sexual contact. Also, it's spread during birth from mom to newborn if mom has this hepatitis B virus. There is a vaccine available for this one as well. 
to help prevent it. Hepatitis C is also a blood-borne pathogen. It's usually acquired by contact with infected blood. That means it's acquired through needle sharing, um, contaminated needles for drug use, and uh, through getting tattoos with contaminated needles. There is no vaccine available for hepatitis C. So prevention of these viruses, um, A and B, get the vaccine, and we are all vaccinated against hepatitis A and B. Hepatitis C, don't share contaminated needles, don't, don't do drugs, kids, and um, don't get tattoos unless it's from a very reputable tattoo parlor. All right, pancreas, another accessory organ of the digestive system. But pancreas is a very busy organ. It acts as both an exocrine and an endocrine gland. And um, it, ta it acts as an exocrine gland in digestion. It secretes pancreatic juices that travel through the common bile duct to the duodenum. And that's where the chemical digestion of a lot of our food takes place. It secretes enzymes like amylase, trypsin and lipase to digest lipids and carbohydrates and proteins. The pancreas can also act as an exocrine gland by secreting hormones and it secretes the two hormones insulin and glucagon. Insulin is that important hormone that controls blood glucose levels. Remember insulin in the bloodstream allows glucose to be absorbed into the cells so it can lower blood glucose levels. Last accessory organ of the digestive system is the gallbladder. The function of the gallbladder is to store bile. The bile is produced in the liver, but then it's stored in the gallbladder. And it is the bile salts that are um, emulsifiers of fat. And what that means is they help to digest fat that you've eaten in the diet that's been digested and is sitting in the uh, duodenum. That's how fat gets digested. It's connected to the liver via the common bile duct. Disorders of the gallbladder are gallstones. These are um, buildup of cholesterol and other substances. Gallst the gallbladder itself can be surgically removed and if it's missing though, how in the world do you digest fat? Well, very carefully I guess would be the answer. Without a gallbladder, bile is released from the liver straight into the small intestine. This allows you to still digest most of your foods. However, uh, if you eat a very fatty diet, a greasy diet, um, like a fatty or greasy or high fiber food becomes harder to digest. This section of your notes, you can go to www.cdc.gov to get more information. Click on healthy living. Vitamins are, there are four fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. Why are fat soluble vitamins limited? Uh, limited? Why do you need to be careful only to take the recommended daily dosage? It's because they're dissolved in your adipose tissue or in your fat. And because they're dissolved in fat cells, they hang around in the body for a long time. And if you take too many of them, they can build up to toxic levels. The water soluble vitamins are C and B. Here's a good summary table for the accessory structures of the digestive system. Salivary glands secrete saliva and this moistens food. It also contains an enzyme amylase for digesting carbohydrates. And then the site of action would be the mouth. Pancreas. Digestive secretions include ions that neutralize the acidic chyme and enzymes that digest carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and nucleic acids. Site of action of this digesting is the small intestine. The liver has a digestive function to produce bile. This is a liquid that emulsifies fats and it makes chemical digestion easier to facilitate absorption of fats. The target would be the small intestine for the bile. And the gallbladder, it stores the bile and then it releases it into the small intestine, so the target site is the small intestine. Let's do some review questions. And one more review question. 
Here's some think about it. Um, pause the video, see if you can come up with the answers. Come back and I will show them to you. Why can uncontrolled diarrhea be life threatening? Uh, uncontrolled diarrhea will cause dehydration. You're losing too much water and your body can't balance it out. Where in the digestive tract are most nutrients absorbed? The small intestine. Where in the digestive tract is water primarily absorbed? This would be the large intestine. In which part of the digestive tract is most of our microbiome located? That would be the large intestine, our friendly bacteria. Be able to explain the difference between digestion and absorption. Last question. The digestive enzyme responsible for fat digestion is? Thanks for listening, guys. I'll see you in class later this week.